but kind of shifting the attention on the children. And so um, I'm going to turn now to the specificity of audio. So what does it really mean to have a wide ranging conversation between critic and novelist? And is the conversation best appreciated in a sound only medium, right? Like, could this have been a web show or could it have been in a different kind of format? And I think the embodied voice is something that really distills what a conversation is. And so we wanted the podcast to kind of be an opportunity for people to not worry about what they look like when they were agreeing to do the show, because that could be a real obstacle for some people to have to think about that. And we were also thinking a lot of people right now were eager to do this because they were in isolation and hadn't talked to a lot of people. And so what we were offering was a chance to be in a nice conversation for an hour and a half. Um, and to us, you know, it was a surprise how many people in our first season jumped at that opportunity. Uh, so anyway, the embodied voice as opposed to the printed word or physical um, appearance of participation is the same. And in an audio-only medium, especially as opposed to print, cadence and tone are going to be available to the listener in a different kind of way. And listeners indeed pay more attention to the non-verbal sound elements that would be absent in print or less notable in video. And I don't know if you're talking about this, but silent spoke conversation, all the things that I hadn't given the thought, talk, thought to before became things I paid attention to when editing the DVD. So the sound of laughter was something you never want to cut out on the podcast. The sound of like people thinking or pausing, um, nervous laughter, laughter of recognition, all of these kinds of things that are signs that the conversation has lift off that the participants are drawing in the virtual room together. And so the warmth of audio is something that I think differentiates it from like the standard typeface, right? That kind of disembodied of one associated with print paper. Um, one of my grad students, James Graney, is the blog editor for novel dialogue. So he wrote our first blog post of season two. Uh, at the bottom here called On the Audio Culture of Letters. And in it, he quoted Michael Silverblatt, who hosts the radio show Bookworm. Um, and I thought this quote captures the feeling of what it is to produce an audio, podcast, an audio show. So this is Silverblatt talking. If you're doing it for print, you have to invent coherence, edit for coherence. But people listening to an interview hear the naturalness and immediacy of the exchange, the freshness of it. I often say that people don't really listen to an interview until they hear that the exchange is friendly or enjoyable. This has more to do with the sound of laughter or breath, with the whole alphabet of the sub folk confusion. So, laughter, breath, not technically sub vocal, but these are the sounds of thought and of conviviality. And I often think that the best scholarly podcasts are actually making use of our easy skills. Um, as a host, what you're doing is you're guiding, you're facilitating. You're not really a strong authority figure. In fact, sometimes you're very often relinquishing authority to the people you're talking to, and you're learning from them, and you're in the moment. And I think being like learning to listen to what people are saying and respond, and to let things go off script. These are the things that Having had time in the classroom, I feel translate really well into producing a podcast and hosting it. Where I differ from the classroom, of course, is that after it's over, you have a chance to edit it, right? That's huge. <laughs> and so you can bring those moments that really work into something that's shaped with coherence, but again, of a different kind than, um, than that of the print, print interview, for example. Um, the second point I'll make about audio is the more critical one, and um, it's particularly with novel dialogue. So from the beginning of our two seasons, we wanted to bring together diverse and international groups of critics and novelists, and I think we've been largely successful in doing that. Um, but doing that also makes me quite mindful of the power dynamics of global English and English as the normative language of digital infrastructure. So translating 
non English speakers, it's far more of a challenge in audio than it would be in French or in video, or you can have the subtitles while somebody is talking. So we largely limited our guests to English speakers because of that. We wrote episode and translation would be an incredible kind of doubling of our workload. And it's also difficult to involve the participants involved. Um, we've also had a variety of accented Englishes on the show. So we had Nigerian. Uh, Indian, Turkish, Mexican, Scottish, Australian. And I think the variety of accents adds to the weight of the conversation or to the content of the conversation. We're often discussing things like translation, uh, writing for a global versus a national audience, the power dynamics of the literary marketplace. And so I think it's important to hear linguistic difference in people's voices when we're discussing those issues. And from a technical standpoint, I also know that when we host speakers, whose voices deviate from standard English or American accents, or whose backgrounds instead of cultural references deviate from those, that the auto transcription tools we're using are going to fail us. And so you're going to see a lot of misrepresentation of words, titles, and all sorts of things. And so you have to be attentive to those types of problems that front face. And uh, in general, you want to try to decenter English particularly the sounds and the spelling of standard English and all those things, but you can't always with the infrastructure you're working with. And that's where our transcript editor, Hannah Jorkinson, a grad student in the department, has been really wonderfully helpful. Um, and so you need humans doing work with you and work, you're all working together. You can't rely on automated tools, as many of you have done with Della. wouldn't know that, but I wanted to tell you that. And then, and thinking about the future of novel dialogue as a way of thinking about the sustainability of podcasts, as I've been describing it, I should say, while podcasts are open access and free for anyone to listen to, they are far more expensive to produce than an academic article. And John, my co-host, and I are lucky to have excellent graduate students who are working on this show, and I think learning transferable skills from being blog editors, from writing for the show, from producing trailers, editing for the show. And so I think that this does give them skills that will serve them well uh, if they're trying to do multimodal writing or looking at different kinds of organizations for public education. Um, for season three, we are bringing in some more hosts to help John and I keep our breakneck pace of content production going. So we've been producing uh, a season every six months or so, and each season has had seven to eight episodes, and that is hard. Uh, so to keep that speed going, we're gonna have some other academics join us as hosts and also field show experts, ideas for experts. Um, season three, we've had, we have a couple partnerships. Uh, we are going to partner with Public Books and be the Public Book 101 podcast. For, so season three of Novel Dialogue will be, I think, season four of a Public Books podcast. So that is, a, I think, something you're going to see more of. Uh, we're online literary magazine partnering with podcasts and trying to produce a public community culture that is multimedia, right? Digital, audio. Um, I'm not hearing about any web shows yet, but maybe that's next step, I'm not sure. Uh, my co-host, John, is a founding member of the Humanities Podcast Network, which just had its first symposium in the fall, last month. And I think this is a good kind of quote summing up the beliefs of the organization. Any theory that cannot be shared in everyday conversation cannot be used to educate the public from Bell Hook. Uh, and so the, the podcast network is a group of instructors, scholars, and creators working together across these dual lines of, you know, professional, amateur, expert, layperson, and trying to connect with each other and to bring, uh, bring the, the, the profile of scholarly podcasting to scholars, to students, and to the general public. And the last organization that I'll mention that is working on this and has done a lot of work since 2007 is the New Books Network, uh, which is a they call themselves a bookstore for podcasts, but everything's free. So these are all um, podcasts, uh, or many of them are done by academics. They're partnered with UPs. 
um, they uh, they have a huge number. And people who listen to podcasts listen to multiple podcasts. So if you want to be exposed to your listen, you want to widen your exposure to a listening audience. It's good to be in this kind of space. So we're going to partner with them for people who like literary podcasts. They'll find our podcast more easily. And this is an aside. What's kind of interesting about this? It was founded by historian Marshall Poe, who was a um, historian of Russia, written four or five books on Russia. And in a, I think you know about ten years ago, like I said, 2007 he founded it. But he was a tenured professor, and he left his professorship to do this whole product. So he's completely committed to this idea of public education and the podcast forum as really reaching an audience that we believe still exists but needs the material. So kind of raising the level of public discourse is I suppose what we're trying to do. Um, all right, so I'll stop there. That's it. <laughs> And so, how do you think about a season? And um, is there, so you said that you were going to add more people to keep up this season. Do you feel like you need to have a certain number come out in order to keep people's attention? Like, yeah. Is there too much of a gap to fall off the awareness of people? I do yeah. think when you're a young show, that is important. And, you know, we are affiliated with a professional society. But when you're operating in the attention economy, the digital sphere, which is primarily what we are doing, we're not relying on the prestige of a legacy media or print, then your audience needs you to produce some amount of content that keeps you, that keeps them remembering you there, right? And so we have a lot of ways of helping remind people that novel dialogue exists in multiple places. So the addition of the blog this year, the in the in-depth section on the website um, was a way of bringing bringing people to the website when there wasn't a new episode dropping. So new episodes drop every two weeks. The blog post comes uh, on the weeks you don't have episodes, and it also draws people into the site in multiple ways. Right, so you're recruiting people to write for the site, including them to write for the site. So you're helping create work for younger academics and grad students, and um, for listeners who you know, love reading a recap or kind of extending their relationship to the show, they can read alongside somebody else. They can read a blog post or somebody looking to episode and think of the case. So it kind of just extends the amount of talk about the show. And of course, we're asking about the show. Is two weeks sort of like what right? I mean, would you prefer to have a week? Or? Well, we had a week for season one, and that was a break next to the um, Everybody worked. Had a, it was very rigid our, our, our workflow, and everybody, you know, did their part and managed it. But we thought it was fast for the audience too. People had trouble keeping up if there was an episode a week, whereas if there was an episode every two weeks, they had some time to actually catch up with the show. So I think that's the right piece for us. Um, I think a season a year would be a little limited, honestly. And so it's better to have more people who are able to participate at those than I think to just scale back. How, uh, how much do you edit out and how much do you record? Right, so the recording sessions are about mm, 60 75 minutes, and then we usually aim for a 35 to 45 minute show. And so there are tips for editing. Um, so, in writing, you, also, you kind of want smooth transitions. In audio editing, sharp transitions vocally can be very helpful because if someone references something, something they said, in a previous part of the conversation, and that's the logical way, and you cut that previous part, it's a bit of a, a difficult editing moment. Whereas you say, well, now I'm turning to this, that's an editing moment, you know? So it helps you kind of keep track of how to make the show feel coherent, even if so excited. Yeah. I was thinking about our Uh, 
uh, in the business of coming up with the with an implementation of the fact that I put it forward an argument, sport player, and so on. But then I got a listener to every time you thought about it. Here is my application. Here is not. Here is a word. Here is a word. Or something like that. Right? Yeah. So it's a completely different skill that you know, needs to learn. Um, and it is important for the professional to be in that for that to have their quotes. Yeah, right? the bill has to be shared. And yeah. In conversation, in everyday conversation, not just any conversation. <laughs> yeah. When it is the public. So there is a certain simplicity there. Uh, which is part of our pedagogy and mm -hmm. that work. But would you like to say more about how this changes, the format changes, the nature of the scholarship itself, and how it also be used as a participant in the You don't know differently? Yeah, I mean, I typically think it makes you feel more like a teacher. Uh, like, I think if your primary identity is writer scholar, this will make you feel like, by my teaching skills were never more valuable than they were, you know. Um, so, any theory that cannot be taught in a classroom cannot be used to educate the public, right? <laughs> so, I feel like that's a very similar kind of sentiment. And um, the thing about the status of the podcast of scholarship is, I think, if it's breaking new ground, it's more in terms of the ways in which you address each other in, 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 and in the public, right? I mean, it is a kind of return to an older moment in critical history when, you know, academics had larger audiences and were used to speaking to a more general audience. And so I think it's recovering a little bit more of that older identity. Um, I think, too, the idea that you're breaking ground in these conversations. I mean, it's a, it's a more personal kind of ground, you know? So if you were thinking of a novel and you had an entire interpretation of it and gave it to the author, they would probably say, well, thank you. I have nothing much to add to it, That's right? right? <laughs> and so it really helps you think about the relationship between, I, I think, criticism and craft, which are historically separate within the English department, right? I mean, the creative writers often focus on craft and we focus on the arts of reading. And maybe those pedagogies overlap, but we don't talk enough to each other to really know what they do. And so here, part of what the novel critic dialogue also does, I think, to my mind, meets a moment where students are more interested in craft and in making than they ever have been before. And they see reading as something that supplements their writing practice oftentimes. And so as the reading writing dyad becomes writing reading, this kind of conversation, I think, helps me understand where students are going in my opinion, right? Where they are yearning for a kind of creative writing practice, but we wanted to be writing some sort of knowledge of literary tradition. And so when you bring a critic and a writer together, and knowing, of course, that both are capable of multiple forms of writing, the conversation is just different because they don't fall into soft talk with each other. But they get enough to go on that you have a good a good thing. Yeah. Um I have a question, which is how do you think of or how, how do you think of the, the specificity of what you're doing? Would you have a literary critic, university literary critic, and an and an author vis-a-vis -vis, um other formats? For example, like an NPR interview with someone who's not a university critic but is an enthusiastic reader, or, or I guess a another novelist interview interviewing the novel. Like, what what is it that the literary critic can do to be the larger public that's different? Or what are you thinking? What are you yeah. hoping for? So, well, the thing is that literary critics actually have a historical sense of fiction. Right. I mean, they know how stories connect up with other stories. They know how traditions are crafted, and they often have a kind of um, deep well of resources for talking about a pretty wide scope of literature. Right. So it's not just tell me about your latest book and discuss your latest work vis-a-vis -vis your past work. It's how would you respond you know, the soul story, or how, like, who are the writers that influence you, and then you can 
not just stop with the answer to that question, you can actually have a conversation about those writers if you'd like to join them also. Or if you haven't, you can tie them into discourses that um, are germane to say, like, the history of the novel. So this is basically where we start, right? It's a novel dialogue, so we're all interested in this. So there's a kind of specialty uh, work there, I would say. So if you listen to say, Sarah Swisher, something to Matt Winterson, which I did a couple weeks ago, the conversation is much more topical. You know, why is your latest novel about AI? What do you know about AI? Let's talk about Mark Zuckerberg. We don't really do that, you know? Um, we kind of follow. Um, we follow a, I guess, a more scholarly way. I mean, it's not as like, what's happening in the room right now and how do people respond to their events. It's how do you think about um, sometimes the history of the novel in light of like, like the latest academic conversations, but those conversations are now made relevant to the public. So we're having Pauline Lai and Yet Win on, and they talk a lot about this pandemic and about anti Asian sentiment. And, you know, yeah, has a lot to say about those questions, but we also talk about it through the history of colonial theory and of his several novels and of like Frank Sinan, who's very intense here. So it's just a different uh center, a different like level of reference and the cost of the conversation that we're having. Yeah, I think that's a The centrality of English is one thing. Um, the, of course, I would say that we wanted to have a Japanese writer on the show who couldn't speak English. And the steps you would have had to take to make that happen were possible, but it would have to have, you know, been like a very special exclusive. <laughs> um, so I think working across the English boundary is, is a challenge I'm not averse to taking on, but it's one that you have you need a lot of time and a lot of buy-in from everybody involved to do. Imagine the editing the transcripts, they would have to do it, or the critics would have to do it, but then I can't speak every language. Um, so I would say that is one limitation. Uh, another limitation of audio when you're often have a group of people who aren't the most tech savvy in the world is you can't always upgrade to the fancier excellent technically sound audio platform because then the people involved wouldn't be able to download the app or do the thing. And so we stuck with Zoom. And so the audio is passive, I would say. And we don't if you were an audio engineer, you would listen to our show and think, well that's amazing. It's really just passive and it won't be clicked. And so that's a little we're not ambitious Yeah. Do you know who this is? No, there's yeah. like who the audience is and you know, numbers and location yeah. and like what time. So we have analytics for downloads and we're doing pretty well. I mean, but you're going to beat the average. Now that, you know, events do, who knows how many people are tuning, tuning in. But the average academic talk, I mean, our lowest number is just like for the, I mean, the numbers are just on a different scale. So, I think when we connect with public books and these other networks, the numbers are going to jump again because we have proof that numbers are higher. So you're dealing more in like the late hundreds to thousands than you are with like 20 to 100. You know, I mean, 100 downloads just would not be what you So there's a much wider scale of listenership. Um, we hear from some listeners directly, and it, depending on where you hear from them, tell you something about them. So the people tweeting at us are often younger grad students or young undergrads or people who seem in their 20s, you know. Um, the people emailing us through WordPress seem like they might be of an older demographic and they don't seem affiliated with universities if they're emailing through WordPress. We have some list of people who might be at universities and not using their email from universities. So we don't, we get, I mean, some and what, so I feel like it's very, I feel like it is a genuinely academic and non-academic audience. And the messages we get through WordPress are kind of hilarious, honestly. Mm -hmm. They really are funny. Uh, so they, they seem like a lay audience to me. Yeah. What about funding? 
understood. You know, so yeah. beginning now, you get me excited, but you know, we, we send you $10. How did you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Good question. I could start a Patreon and have people donate, but part of being a scholarly podcast is that they're not accepting money from them. So, um, Science Novel Studies gives us money. Yeah. Um, I have some grant money from Duke that I repurposed for the show because I could travel to the pandemic. Uh -huh. so it's ridiculous um, and Brandeis. So, that's where our job works. And obviously, we have grad support across the school. So, that's how we're funding it. I wouldn't say it's particularly expensive for institutions to fund. I mean, you really could shoot through the podcast. So, it's not expensive for us. But um, it's expensive compared to the work that we need to go through. Yeah. And, I mean, so, and why are the authors going to this degree? Ah, so we are academics. We are not making money off of them. So the fact that we don't generate money for ourselves, I think, plays into the fact that the work is getting paid. So it's not a, there's no honorarium. No one is paid to the show. The only people who get paid are the grad students who work on the show and the undergrads who audio it. Um, so yeah, it's mostly, it's, well, we just never offered to pay anyone, and <laughs> they never asked. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say that I want the honorarium to die. I think when people come and give us talks at a university, they should be paid to give those talks. But for the podcast model, um, you're not traveling. You're, I think you're enjoying the experience for the most part. Um, and a lot of the people who were doing it, it started through contact. So friends were asking friends, right? Um, so Orhan Thomas and Bruce Robbins had taught a course together. And so he was willing to do this with Bruce. Um, others just responded and were up for the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jason. Do you know if anybody said on the show that they're appearing in conjunction with the publication of their book? Because I mean, oh, yeah. I'm not sure that. Yeah, so I mean, I think George Sonder has happened to come in with Russia, the, the yeah. Russian short stories. And so that was a good coincidence because he tied in with his score on that. Of course, he also did a as a climb show in 19 hours for four hours. But <laughs> <laughs> um, different audience. <laughs> and we have a mix in each season a couple of writers who seem to have timed it with a book, a couple of writers who haven't. Have it with a book and are just interested in the conversation. Some writers who are based at university, some who aren't. And so I think it tends to have a kind of natural balance. Sometimes the biggest name you can get them when you're on tour, right? So Jennifer Egan initially said, I want to come with my book tour, and then she said, Oh, for it. So they might start out with some ideas over time. It's very valuable. Between the folks who are doing promotion and yeah. those who are just kind of there, yeah. Is, are you noticing kind of a difference in the tenor of the conversation? Oh. The... No, I actually am not. When I think about the kind of people who came who had a book out pretty soon, it they didn't keep bringing it back to that. They really didn't. And maybe it's because it's more important to just have your voice out there. And it's not as important to seem like you're selling something. It's just more being interesting in public that will sell your book. Your podcast with Patricia Lockett. Oh, we were thinking about her. We might get her. I mean, it sort of depends on which critic. He was someone who had come up before, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I think he would be good. And are you, I mean, what I asked the question before about Susan, I was focusing primarily on sequences, but do you think of a season as thematically like that? Uh, so there's a theme yeah. of the season, or it's just it's too hard to get a draw for kind of a story. Yeah. So we discussed that with Public Books and with Pete, and kind of figuring out our partnership. Uh, they had had previous seasons that were themed, right? One was a theme on data, one was on the novel now, and this episode had a theme around it. And Chrissy Cole, the way that we get scheduled, sometimes episodes get scheduled a year in advance, where they set schedule the same. They are not sure. To be able to have a theme can require a degree of control that I don't think we have. Yeah. So the, the consistency really comes from that. Also, French. 
I was like, why? I don't think that was totally out there. Okay, so.